Welcome back to Zagreb, the capital of Croatia, for the second part of Europe District. We're now standing on Bani Elacic Square, which is the commercial heart of the city, a very buzzing, very vibrant place where people come to meet, to share a cup of coffee, or to go out at night. Now, in this part of the show, we'll continue our journey across Croatia. We'll tell you more about the state of the Croatian economy, about local culture, and of course, about the booming tourism industry. But first, we talked a lot about the prospect of EU membership in the first part of the show. It's now time to ask the locals what they really think about it. I think we'll have more job possibilities. There'll be a need for more graduated, more specialized people. I hope that our wages go up and that our standard of living gets better as well. I'll be happy if Croatia joins the EU, but I don't think it's going to be as great as politicians say. They keep saying everything will change, it'll be fantastic. A woman came up to me yesterday. She was 96. She said, this would be the sixth state I've lived in. I asked, which state? She said, well, the European Union. I'm looking for an editor. I hope that the Union will help me publicize my work in Europe. We're now standing in front of the Central Bank of Croatia because we want to talk about the economy and I'm glad to be joined by our next guest, Vladimir Shelebai Selye. Vladimir, hello. Hello. You're a Franco-Croatian businessman. You're also uh, the manager of an investment fund. Talking about banks, foreign banks are very present in Croatia. They have invested a lot of money. This shows that your economy is very open. This is another proof that we, to some extent, have already integrated the European Union because if you look at the banking sector, where 80% of the banks are in foreign hands, big Italian groups, Austrian groups. Uh, if you look at the, at the foods and beverages and agricultural industry, where also foreign groups like the French Lactalis, for instance. Of course, uh, if you look at the banking sector, this may be, uh, let's say, the most sensitive area of this loss of sovereignty. Now, after the fall of communism and the end of the war, local companies have had to restructure themselves. Uh, has the transition period been difficult for Croatia? I have to say that, uh, unfortunately, Croatia has lost a lot of its industrial production today. And this is, this is true, uh, because the former socialist companies, big industrial groups, they worked uh, for a big, larger market, for ex-Yugoslav market, uh, for the ex-communist ex uh, eastern uh, countries. They have lost this access to these markets and they had to adapt. Well, to better understand how some Croatian companies have managed to restructure themselves and to reposition themselves on the European market, let's watch our next report. With around 40,000 employees, Agricor is Croatia's biggest private corporate group. Headed up by billionaire Ivica Todoric, it specializes in retail distribution and the food industry. Another Croatian success story is Atlantic Group, a company that dominates niche markets of vitamins and energy drinks. Its young CEO is Emil Tedeschi. Weekly business magazine Leiders cited them both among the 40 most ambitious Croatians, and both are already reaching out to Europe. I think these two are preparing themselves for Croatia's accession to the European Union. When Croatia is a member, I think they'll be ready to enter into the single market. Tedeschi's already made acquisitions in Germany. Todoric already sells his products on the single market. I think they both have what it takes. The pair began building their empires in the early 90s during the former Yugoslavia's transition from communism. Todoric started up a business selling flowers before the country's war of independence. His critics accused him of profiting from cronyism and the privatization of state companies. The group dismisses the argument as being irrelevant. What's most important is to look at what companies became. You know that there were lots of other companies that changed hands during privatization. Some worked out, others didn't. I think the most important thing is what Agrocore turned into afterwards. 
Both companies first concentrated on becoming number one in the domestic market before turning their energies to regional trade in the Balkans. That done, Europe is now the new goal. Since Sedevita is a food supplement, it's subject to Directive 46 of the EU. So everything here is done in accordance with community rules. Helped by acquisitions they've already made in member states, both companies are looking forward to the benefits that will come the day all their products carry credentials that say made in Europe. Then for you is like a stamp, like a proof that the product is a, is a high quality and is, is secure and it's controlled. And in that aspect, uh, the EU stamp is going to, to give uh, additional boost and, uh, let's say, uh, trust uh, uh, to the product and services what we are producing. But it's not a done deal yet. Like other countries hoping to join the EU, the global financial crisis has put substantial pressure on Croatia's economy. Membership of Club Europe and its promises of prosperity will only come if those at the head of the country can show evidence of economic strength, good management and transparency. Now this is a central market of Zagreb. This is where locals come to buy fresh products, fresh vegetables and fruits. I don't know if you come shopping here. Yeah, I'll tell you something. First of all, uh, we, this, all what you hear, see here is, is, eco uh, is um, ecologically grown. Uh, there's uh, a real possibility for Croatia to, to, to develop this organic food uh, sector. We have no big industry, that's why we have no pollution. No pollution. Of course. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say, these beautiful products are not always on the table of our tourists because still Croatia is importing a lot of, of food, of uh, fruit, uh, vegetables and meat also. Now, talking about tourism, it's no secret Croatia has become extremely uh, popular, particularly among European tourists who come here because of the beautiful coasts, uh, Zagreb as well. What is your assessment of the way tourism has been developed? I think the good example to, to follow is in Istria because they made a very good segmentation. Uh, they have an offer for mass tourism, an offer for, for, for luxury tourism. They have uh, this gastronomic uh, uh, countryside to, to tourism, a good culture offer. So there is an example to, to, to follow and to succeed our, let's say, uh, improvement of the touristic sector and exploitation. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Thank you. Now, talking about agro-tourism, about the countryside, the next report will take us to Slavonia in the east of Croatia. It's not as well known as the rest of the country, but we think it's worth checking out. Away from the Adriatic Sea and the postcard cliches of Croatia, there's Slavonia. Less than 250 kilometers east of the capital Zagreb, it used to be Yugoslavia's breadbasket. Our journey starts in Stara Capella a village where Dr. Tucic is hoping that tourism will help jumpstart the local economy. In just a few years, this little town has gone from about a hundred people to just over a dozen. We all by ourselves and that's hard. Most of the time the doctor works alone. If he wasn't here, he would take care of me. <laughs> Abandoned and destroyed by war, it was rebuilt to meet both traditional and environmentally friendly standards. The idea of an eco-friendly village came from the local doctor, who didn't want to see his hometown fall to pieces. His plans were to turn Stara Capella into a showcase of the best of local arts and crafts. Next stop, Ilok, Croatia's easternmost town. Here you can visit vineyards, wine cellars, and sample the country's most famous wine, Sirijevo. It's a Tramina from 1947, and uh, it's, it was a very good year, but uh, it's also famous because uh, 11,000 uh, of these bottles were uh, on the, on the, on, uh, in British Castle for, uh, were used for the coronation of the Queen Elizabeth II. Surrounded by Serbia, the town was invaded and then abandoned during the war. It was not until the 1997 peace agreement that wine growers started producing again. Before the war, it was uh, uh, one situation. We had uh, more industry, like um, textile industry and so. And after the war and after the socialism and everything, what, what was happened, it was it was possible to build it up again. And naturally uh, came uh, tourism as a solution. The scars of war still linger. 
but Croatia is working together with its neighbours to encourage tourism in the region. An important step that would create jobs and stop young people from moving away. We are very well aware that most of the infrastructure is on the coast. In the continental part of Croatia, we sometimes have to start from scratch. There are only the bare necessities. But we hope that soon we'll be able to take care of the region's problems. And of course, we are counting on European funds which support these types of activities. Next stop, the renowned Vinkovsky Folklore Festival, a colourful celebration of local tradition. <laughs> And finally, we head to Kopachki Rit Nature Park, one of Europe's most beautiful marshlands and home to a rare and protected ecosystem. The Danube's water levels change the landscape with the seasons, and the great white eagle is the park's mascot, representing the region's hopes that its fortunes will soon take off again. After Slavonia and Zagreb, we'll now take you to the coasts. Croatia's coasts are famous around the world for their limpid waters and staggering islands. And of course, there's also Dubrovnik. I know it may sound as a cliche to call it the jewel of the Adriatic, but this is indeed a very special place. We'll show you its marble streets, its Baroque monuments, and its amazing city walls. But in order to do so, we need a guide. So let's go and meet him. Dino Milinovic, hello. You are an Christoph. art historian and uh, novelist. I've got your latest book here in which you talk mainly about Iraq, but there's one city, you understand, you really like to visit and revisit. It's, of course, Dubrovnik, and you've chosen to meet us here on the famous city walls. It is. And we've chosen this place because there's a marvelous view, a beautiful view over the roofs of Dubrovnik, the domes of its churches. But the main reason is really, I mean, that these walls are a masterpiece of military architecture built in 15th and the 16th century by best local and Italian architects to protect this little republic. But the real paradox in history, and one of the reasons why we're here, is that they only one time in history served to really protect the citizens of Dubrovnik. They were never used in battle until the last decade of the 20th century when the war for independence in Croatia started. Do you know, this is the first place you've chosen to show us. I understand this is one of the landmarks of Dubrovnik. It's located just off Stradum, the main street. What are we seeing now? This is the Sponza Palace. It was originally the house of the uh, customs, the customs house. So eventually you know that the fortunes of Dubrovnik and its independence were kept by its trade. Trading all throughout the Mediterranean and throughout Europe was what really kept this republic alive. And this is also a place where past meets present. We saw it when we entered the, the building. There's a small memorial to the victims of the war, uh, the war from 91 to 95, when Croatia uh, was fighting against the Serbian army. This is, of course, a very emotional place for, for locals, I guess. It is a way to commemorate, I mean, those who have fallen during 91, 95 of war in Dubrovnik and its vicinity. And it's a way to, like you said, I mean, to link the past and the present uh, is such a natural choice. So, do you know, this is the fortress of Dubrovnik, right? The old stone are still here, but yes. the place has been visibly transformed into a concert hall. Christoph, we are inside one of the towers that made the fortifications of the old Dubrovnik. But what is fascinating is that after the restoration, we are witnessing here a rehearsal by Julian Racklin and his friends. This time it's St. Martin's in the Field Orchestra, who are part of a festival, which is beginning, I mean, at the beginning of September, and which is prolonging somehow in the uh, summer festival of Dubrovnik, consisting of theatre plays, consisting of uh, musical concerts, during which time Dubrovnik really becomes the cultural capital of Croatia.
As you can see, we've just left the uh, historic centre of Dubrovnik. We're now in what used to be a busy industrial centre. The reason we're here is because Dino wants to introduce us to a friend of his, who is, as I understand, a painter. She is. She's Dubrovka Losic. I've known her from uh, the days in Paris. She has an atelier in this industrial zone of Dubrovnik, and she's a good representative of a modern artist in Croatia today. Let's go to see what she's doing. Hello Dubrovka, thank you for having us here. What are you working on at the moment? I'm working on the theme of the runners. I worked on it in the 1980s but abandoned the project. I've now started again using a new technique of mixed collage. But is it easy for you to be an artist in Dubrovnik? Is there a vibrant cultural life or do you get the feeling that tourism has taken over everything else? I think that our city offers great chances for artists, but it's important to leave the crowds and the tourists behind to fuel your creativity. Well, Dino, it's already time to say goodbye. Yes, and we'll leave with the view of the Dubrovnik walls behind us, the way we started this morning. Well, thank you very much for showing us your Dubrovnik. Thank you for watching this edition of Europe District. We'll be back next month. We'll go to another country in the region. In the meantime, thank you for watching and please stay tuned on France 24.